You know, guys, from the days I used to have my nationwide radio show back in the 90s, uh, I've always said that when you're in a losing streak, you just think absolutely no break is ever going to go your way again, ever, period. Now, when you're winning, oh, hey, everything's fine and dandy. You know, you're one of those guys that, hey, there's always a bright light at the end of the tunnel. The glass is always half full. But when you're in a losing streak, forget about it. There is nothing, nothing that is going to go your way. Now, in reality, the other thing that I've always added is that over the course of the long haul, more often than not, those breaks go in your direction. But when you're losing, forget about it. You don't want to hear that type of advice. Case in point, yours truly, November, December, January, February, great run in college basketball. The past week, oh my gosh, did I take on Water Fast. I mean, it was just a miserable betting week. And yesterday, I come out with the top-rated 15-dime best bet release, my first play of the tournament, and what do I do? I take Connecticut. Yeah, you know, Connecticut, that team that came up with the four-overtime win against Cincinnati, less than 24 hours later, blew out Temple, less than 24 hours later, then beat up Memphis in the AAC title game. Yes, Connecticut, laying three and a half points against Colorado. My wife and I out running some errands yesterday after I updated all the sites. We go, stop to get a bite to eat at this Italian restaurant, and I look at my phone and I'm down by 11 points. Down by 11, laying three and a half. You don't have to go to MIT to do that math. So we're sitting there and of course in the restaurant, they have direct TV. They've got TVs every place. And what do they have on? They have one of those music channels on. Not even a music video channel. They just have a music channel on. And I'm going, am I the only guy here that knows that there happens to be a little college basketball being played today. So I punch up on my phone. First, I go to our website, and I'm going, eh, I'm still down by 11 points. A little later, it dawns on me, hey, let me go to ESPN. Let me hit the live button so at least I can start seeing how things are going. While I was worrying our meal, suddenly Connecticut starts to make a little run. They're only down by four. They're down by three. Next thing I look at my phone, and I'm up by five, and I'm going, Jesus, I must have taken too many bites out of my sandwich here. Suddenly, three minutes to go in the game, I'm up. I think it was 11 points. I'm feeling a little better. But when you're in that losing streak, you don't ever think you're going to get the break. Here comes Colorado. Colorado comes back. It's a three-point game. My wife and I, we pay the bill. We're sitting in my car, and I'm looking here, and I'm looking at my phone. And we're sitting there watching the phone for the final five minutes of this game. Yes, there was only two minutes of action, but, you know, it actually took 55 minutes to get those two minutes played. Connecticut, every time they go down, they hit a free throw. What happens? Colorado, uncontested layup. Connecticut, two more free throws. Colorado, uncontested layup. And the number keeps going down to three. And, of course, you know as well as I do. Again, we don't have to be MIT math majors here. You're sitting there and you're working the numbers in your mind. You know it. You do it just like I do. I'm sitting there. Okay, I'm going up by three. I've got 32 seconds left. Connecticut just hit two more free throws. Colorado's going to come down. They're going to take the two-pointer here. They'll immediately foul. And you're working the math going, how am I going to get this cover? I'm laying three and a half. How am I going to get the four-point win? Finally, 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 Colorado misses a shot. And Connecticut gets the rebound. And Connecticut gets fouled. And they calmly go to the line and hit another free throw. And it just shows you betting teams in the postseason that are exceptionally good at the free throw line. And Connecticut is one of the top teams in the nation. I think going into yesterday's game, they were hitting at a 74.8% clip at the free throw line. That got me the cover yesterday. So one more cliche, never look a gift horse in the mouth, and that was Connecticut yesterday. So thank you, Kevin Ollie and the Huskies. Listen, I would have been so ticked off doing this video report today if I had lost Connecticut for one reason, because I went 3-0 and with the complimentary plays yesterday. Florida Gulf Coast told you, North Carolina, your money was going to be on the Tar Heels backups if you wanted to play them in that game, and would they really care? Florida Golf Coast with the easy cover is a 22-point dog. Kentucky hammering Stony Brook. And then in the NIT, I give you a winner there as well with Valpo taking care of business. Uh, so a 3-0 sweep yesterday. If I had gone 3-0 with the free picks and lost my best bet, there would have been hell to pay today on this video report. Hey, so listen, I'm on a 25-12 uh, and 12 roll with the complimentary plays here short term. I've got three more nighttime selections. Going to take a look at the games between Notre Dame, Michigan, Oregon, Holy Cross, and BYU, Virginia Tech, another NIT second rounder. That's coming up here in just a moment. Now, in terms of first round action yesterday, I thought it was kind of interesting, some of the quirks. Uh, you know, favorites for the day went nine and seven. Three of the seven dogs won outright. Double-digit chalks yesterday, four and three against the spread. Losers, North Carolina, Duke, Miami of Florida, all three from the ACC. The covers, another ACC team, Virginia, Kentucky, Kansas, and Indiana. Um, 
you know, I also thought it was kind of uh, funny yesterday that the games in Providence, all four of the favorites failed to cover. And two of those dogs, Wichita State and Yale, won outright. So again, the Chalks went nine and seven. The other significant number to consider from yesterday is how we are doing with our brackets, because that's all that counts here with the company, okay? So coming out, uh, going into the tournament, I said in my uh, bracket analysis, I've always believed that you've got to be able to come out of the first round of play uh, with 22 to 24, 26 wins. If not, you just simply mathematically don't have enough teams alive as you progress through your bracket. And of course, you've got to be able to come out with the first round with all four of your final four, and hopefully all eight of your final elite eight teams still alive and barking. Well, the guy who had the best performance yesterday was Matt Rivers. He had 12 out of 16. I went 11 and 5, as did Brad Wilton, Anthony Red, uh, Steve Budin, Chris Jordan. Uh, next up, Scott Delaney went 10 and 6. Shawn Michaels went 10 and 6. Uh, Trace Adams went 10 and 6, but lost one of his final four teams last night with Seton Hall getting bounced from the tournament. Took a shot with that dark horse and uh, definitely came up on the wrong side. Gabriel DuPont, 9 and 7. Jeff Benton, 8 and 8, and he lost one of his Elite Eight teams. And Chuck O'Brien bringing up the rear at 7-11. What does that mean in terms of a handicapping perspective? Absolutely nothing. What does it mean in terms of company bragging rights? That's all that matters with that recap. So I'll keep you posted as we continue through the brackets. Now, today, the big featured play is going to be Shawn Michaels. Uh, Sean cashed in with the 25-dime play last night on Kentucky. He was coming off a 25-dime play the night before with um, Texas Arlington against Savannah State in the College Insider Tournament. Today, I saw that he had his 100-dime max wager release in college basketball's first of the season. His last two 100-dime college basketball plays last year, Final Four, cashing in with uh, Wisconsin taking care of business against Kentucky and in the round of 16 with Duke over Utah. Those were his last 200 dime releases. Today, 100 dime max wager play, Notre Dame and Michigan. I made it the half price play of the day using coupon code SEAN, S E A N. Um, keep in mind, 100 dime plays in the NFL, 61, 38, and 3. 100 dime plays in college football, past six seasons, 23 and 10. This play is just as strong. It's the half price play of the day. Trace Adams lost a play yesterday. When's the last time I said that? Hmm, probably two weeks ago. <laughs> I mean, he had an ultra rare 2,500 star play. Hit his lone play in college football. Hit his lone play in the NFL. Hit his first play in college basketball with Purdue getting the backdoor cover against Michigan State last Sunday. Yesterday, had a 2,500 star play. He lost with Seton Hall. So that means today he's only going for winning day number 38 out of 59. That means today he's only made $1 betters in all sports combined over the past five months and one week, $61,950. And that means today he only has his W wager 2000 star winner number nine in a row and 25 out of 32 on Oklahoma and Cal State Bakersfield. And once again, it's a discounted play. You can save $55 by using coupon code ADAMS. Just as strong as Holy Cross outright over Southern a couple of nights ago, uh, Wichita State over Vandy on Tuesday in one of the play-in games, Purdue over Michigan, of course, uh, last Saturday, Kentucky over Alabama last Friday, Seton Hall over Creighton last Thursday, Holy Cross outright over Lehigh last Wednesday. You get the drill. Eight straight winners going for number nine in a row today. All your other discounts, promos, et cetera, are over on the homepage. Let's get to your complimentary plays now. I'll run them in reverse uh, chronological order for you which means the first game is going to be coming up is going to be the Notre Dame contest going at 940 Eastern time. I know the Irish got annihilated by North Carolina in the ACC semifinals. But listen, one of the reasons that I used North Carolina uh, in that game is because it was a monster, monster revenge game for the Tar Heels. Because you remember, they had the double-digit lead in South Bend in the regular season meeting, right? And then they just went ice cold from the field. Notre Dame got every benefit of every officiating call, kept constantly going to the line, hitting their free throws, and walked away with the upset win as the three-point dog. So North Carolina was out for blood that day, and it showed, because they scored 47 points, they being the Irish in that game in that 78-47 to loss. But I'm looking at this matchup, and I think that Notre Dame will rebound in a big way tonight against, um, against Michigan. Think about what Michigan has done here. For the Wolverines, this is going to be their fifth game in a nine-day stretch, right? So they played three straight games in Indianapolis, 
for the Big Ten tournament. Then they flew to Dayton. Okay, hey, you're going for from Ann Arbor uh, down to Indianapolis. You go back home. You fly over to Dayton. You have the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the play-in game against Tulsa and Nip and Tuck affair till the very end. Then they leave Dayton. They have to fly to Brooklyn. I was reading uh, the story that they got in at 2:48 a.m. Eastern time in the New York City area on Thursday morning, yesterday morning after playing. The night before. They then went ahead and uh, got to their hotels by like four o'clock uh, yesterday morning. Again, fifth game and a nine and a half day stretch. I think this is a very difficult spot for the Wolverines, who, when you look at this game in terms of a matchup perspective, they do not have the size or the talent along the front line to deal with a bigger Notre Dame front court uh, led by uh, a couple of guys that are 6'8", 6'10". I, so I think Notre Dame is going to be able to dominate the boards, which will then key the Irish transition game. Um, I just like Notre Dame here. They have a deeper bench. Michigan is basically a six-man rotation because of injuries this season. So I'm going to go with the Irish who go about eight deep, and I think they're well-rested, obviously, and they rebound after that embarrassing performance in the ACC tournament. So Notre Dame is going to be your first play. Uh, your next complimentary play here, let me just see in terms of uh, the order of these damn games. I guess that was going to be your, um, excuse me, guys, I'm looking here for the times. Dun, 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 dun. Hey, you got to love these live video reports. I'm going to go with uh, Oregon. Uh, Oregon against uh, Holy Cross. Holy Cross has had a hell of a run. Five straight outright wins as an underdog. From a Crusaders team that isn't any good. I don't care that they won the Patriot League by winning at Lehigh outright as a 10-point underdog last Wednesday. I don't care that they beat Southern as a two-point dog a couple of nights ago in the play-in game. They aren't any good. I don't care. They lost five straight in 12 of their previous 15 games before this incredible run. Their biggest non-conference game this year was when they took on Kansas. They got shellacked 92 to 59. People will say, oh, they're a better team than then. Really? Well, how? Their second biggest non-conference game this year, they played against Rhode Island. They lost that one 74 to 56. The Ducks have won eight in a row. They look really good in the Pac-12 tournament. Beat Washington by six, Arizona by six in overtime. Crushed Utah 88-57 to in the final. The game's in Spokane. I, you can't get more of a home court advantage than if they played the game in Eugene or Seattle. Uh, you got a team that's number two in RPI against a team that's number 248. Crusaders. Nice run, okay? You shoot a lot of triples, 22 three-pointers a game. Over half of your shots against Southern were from beyond the arc, 25 of their 40 shots. That was Southern. This is Oregon, an Oregon team that has, what, four or five double-digit scores that goes almost nine deep. Uh, you've got an Oregon team that has a big front line, including uh, the six foot ten center, uh, whose name escapes me right now, against a... Uh, a uh, Holy Cross team that has its bigger, biggest players, like 6'7", along the front court. I got to lay the points with Oregon for the same reason that I laid the points with Kentucky last night. They're simply a better team against an opponent from a weaker division. And listen, if you want to compare Stony Brook, who Kentucky annihilated last night, versus Holy Cross, Stony Brook is much, much better than the Crusaders. Your final play, I'm going to go into the NIT. As I pointed out yesterday with the selection with Valpo, I think when you look at these NIT games, you always have to realize that the first round games are the toughest ones to pick because you don't know whether a team is going to be motivated to play or not after, for one reason or another, not making the big dance. Uh, to wit, uh, my god-awful pick on St. Bonaventure as a nine-and-a-half-point favorite at home against Wagner a couple nights ago. Clearly, Bonnies, after not making the dance, weren't ready. My free pick on St. Mary's at home a couple of nights ago, barely winning their uh, first-round game. But if these teams get through their first-round game, then they're focused. Then the disappointment is almost gone from not making the big dance. Yeah, they're going to turn on the TV, see other teams, and go, we could have been, th been there. We could have been in that team. But the fact is, they're now in a one-and-done situation, and they have a little focus once again. That's one of the reasons I'm going to take BYU here tonight. Now, I was happy with the fact that BYU was so strong in its game at the Marriott Center uh, in Provo a couple of nights ago on Wednesday night, a first-round uh, annihilation of UAB 97-79. to I wasn't surprised they won that game because the Blazers, playing in Alabama, right, uh, playing in Birmingham, 
uh, didn't even win their own damn conference tournament after leading Conference USA almost for the entire season. That was the 12th time BYU scored at least 90 points uh, on the year. Virginia Tech just happy to be in the postseason for the first time since 2011. Got the win and got the cover in overtime against Princeton at home a couple of nights ago. Now they go from Blacksburg, Virginia to Provo, Utah. Yeah, that's a little bit of a stretch. And they have to play in altitude as well. This is a team that went 3-7 and seven on the ACC road this year. You got a BYU team that is number eight in the nation in scoring, averaging 84 points a game. Again, 12 times they've topped 90. You've got a BYU team that's strong, rebounding the board, number 11 in the nation, averaging averaging a little one, more than 41 uh, boards a game. So despite the fact that I happen to read that the Hokies are like on a 17-4 and four ATS run, I don't care. BYU is the better team. This is a cheap price. I think BYU should have been laying at least nine tonight. So I'm going to go with the Cougars in this one as your other complimentary play to go along with, as I already told you, a couple of other favorites, Notre Dame and Oregon. That'll do it, guys. Best of luck to y'all. And we'll do this again on Saturday morning. Good luck, everybody.